Hello, everyone, and welcome to this MOS Live program called Virtual Planetarium Exploring Space. Before we bring out our two educators, let me introduce myself. My name is Emily. My pronouns are she and her, and I will be your moderator today. Now, this means that I will be the one watching the Q&A box. So if you have any questions throughout the program, or if you are answering questions from our educators, I will be the one relaying information from you to them. Now, if you would like to um, ask a question or tell us anything, you can use that Q&A box that is somewhere on your screen. And we're also offering closed captions during this program. So to see captions, you can click on the CC button and then select show subtitles. So with that, uh, our educators can, can come on screen and then we'll get started. Hello everybody, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns and I'm going to be your presenter today, which means I'm going to be doing uh, most of the talking, but I can't do it alone. Hi everybody, my name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her and I will be your pilot today flying you through space. So uh, today, this month, we're talking about some of the interesting ways our solar system has changed over time and over history. Uh, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about planetary movements. So if we can, uh, Emily, go ahead and highlight or spotlight Katie's screen. You can see she's using a program called Worldwide Telescope, and she's, which is a free open source program. You can find it on the internet. And uh, what you're seeing here is the solar system. You're seeing the planets in their familiar patterns. Mostly we're seeing the outer solar system here, that weird one with the extra wide loop, that's Pluto. Um, and then you've got the planets of the outer solar system, the gas giants. And then um, further in, closer to the middle there, you can see the inner solar system, the small rocky worlds. And this is how we're used to our solar system looking. But it turns out that planets in young solar systems don't hold still. They tend to move around. Of course, we're used to them moving like around the sun, but they actually move in and out as well. We call this planetary migration. And obviously you can't really see that happening in our solar system. Our solar system is an older, more stable solar system. So things aren't moving around very much, but we can see evidence of this migration when we look at other solar systems. So we know there's lots of other solar systems out there and many of our earliest exoplanet discoveries were planets that we don't, of a type we don't have here in our solar system. We call them hot Jupiters. These are, here's an artist's uh, rendition of one. These are gas giants that are very close to their stars. Jupiter is the closest gas giant to the sun in our solar system and it's about 500 million miles away from it. We found gas giants in orbits that only take days or sometimes even hours. They're so close to their stars. Gas giants cannot form that close to their stars. Young stars blast gas out of their immediate vicinity. So planets that form closer to their young star, they tend to be rocky worlds with thin atmospheres. Gas planets, which are mostly gas in atmosphere, they have to form farther away. So for us to find these hot Jupiters, they have to form farther out and then migrate inward. And we keep finding these. We've got new telescopes are coming online. We've had old telescopes working on this. So um, here are a couple of examples, the Kepler Space Telescope, which was our premier planet finding telescope for nine years, found hundreds of these hot Jupiters. Um, there's another telescope being built right now, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is supposed to launch in 2025, and it's going to be able to find more of these hot Jupiters pretty easily. So there's evidence right there that planets don't hold still, at least in young solar systems. They move around. They do eventually sort of stabilize but they are moving around in these young solar systems. We think because they are um, actually gravitationally interacting with each other. So planets don't have to hit, they're not hitting each other usually. Planets don't have to hit each other to affect each other. They can do that just with their gravity. Um, and they also interact with uh, lots of the, these young solar systems are filled with dust. Those interactions with all that dust can actually cause planets to move in and out. Um, so minor collisions 
bigger collisions do happen, that can have an effect. And also um, they can actually affect each other by being in orbital resonance with each other. Young planets can be in what we call resonance. So for instance, um, a planets will be in a one to two residence if every time one of them orbits once, the one inside of it orbits twice. That's a resonance, for instance. The moons of Jupiter, many of those moons are in resonance with each other. This is a thing that we see uh, in our current solar system, and it does mean that they can affect each other just by the way they orbit. So it's a little bit weird to think about. And we do see evidence for migration in our own solar system. So when we look at our solar system the way it is now, the way it is today, it has to have gotten that way by whatever happened in the past, right? So whatever happened in the past has to be able to explain what our solar system looks like today. And there are a few things about our solar system today that really don't make sense if things formed where they are. Mars is one of them. Mars is a very small rocky planet. It's about half the size of the earth little more than half the size of the earth. And it's weirdly small for a rocky world. Models of our early solar system suggest it should not be that small. It should be more on par with uh, earth or Venus in size. So Mars is undersized if it formed where it is now. If everything formed where it is now, Mars should have been bigger. It's not. Okay, well, why is that? And if you look at the asteroid belt, for instance, as well, the asteroids mostly live between Mars and Jupiter, not all of them, but the main belt is between Mars and Jupiter. And when we look at them, they are all scrambled up. So we've got asteroids that are mostly made of rock, and then we've got asteroids that are very icy. Probably those icy ones formed farther out, farther from the young sun, and the rocky ones formed closer in. But when we look at the asteroid belt today, they're all jumbled up. They're all mixed up. They can't have formed that way. So something must have mixed them up, just like something caused Mars to be smaller than expected. And we think a lot of this can be explained by planetary migration in our very young solar system, particularly uh, by one planet, especially, and that is the big guy, Jupiter. So I'm going to tell you about a scenario that I like. I think it's a really cool hypothesis. It's called the Grand Tack Hypothesis. After a sailing term, I guess. I don't know anything about sailing. Um, and it has to do with movements of Jupiter in its early history. So here's what Jupiter looks like today. Today it's about 500 million miles from the sun, give or take. Uh, and in the grand tack hypothesis, this, this scenario, our solar system almost had a hot Jupiter and no inner planets. So and if this theory is right, we almost did not have an inner solar system. The rocky worlds were almost pushed into the sun. So we think right around the time that Jupiter was just about done growing, it began to move Inwards. So it formed somewhere out in the outer solar system. And then shortly after it was, or just about when it was done forming, it started to migrate inwards towards the sun. And this is a large planet. As it started moving, its gravity just caused chaos in the inner solar system, which was still forming. Of course, that's where the rocky worlds are. That's where Earth is. So a lot of the material that was in the inner solar system either got flung off into space or got pushed into the sun by Jupiter's gravity just causing chaos in that early inner solar system. Now that is not good news for planets that are forming in the inner solar system, such as, you know, say, Earth. If Jupiter had continued its migration but it continued moving inwards, which is something, again, we see a lot with those hot Jupiters in other solar systems, these big gas planets right up close to their stars. If Jupiter had continued inward and become a hot Jupiter, it would have either ejected 
everything in the inner solar system out into space or pushed it into the sun. Everything would have been either ejected or pushed into the sun, including the still forming young earth. Clearly that did not happen, which means something stopped Jupiter. Anyone want to take a wild guess what they think could stop a moving gas giant? You can feel free to put question marks if you're just like, I have no idea, but go ahead and take a guess if you have one, because it's kind of a fun story. Mm -hmm. If you think it is. Yeah, so we're just waiting a moment for responses to come in. It was a weird question to ask. Like, <laughs> who's, ever, who's ever thought about what could stop the motion of a gas giant before? I think you might have stumped our audience. That's okay, I'd promise them a cool story, so. I do have one guess for a black hole. Mm, oh, that would certainly do it. Something, it has to be something with the enough power, enough gravitational power or enough collision power to stop the planet. And really, it wasn't a collision. Something did it with gravity. And if you're going to stop one gas giant, is there another guess, Emily? Uh, some people have said the sun, and then others have said maybe the um, asteroid belt because it's so close to Jupiter. It is very close. But if you're going to stop a gas giant, you probably need another gas giant. So we think the thing that slammed the brakes on Jupiter is that it was dragging another gas baby gas giant behind it. This is the kernel of the thing that would become Saturn. When Jupiter started moving inward, it dragged this baby Saturn with it. And as this baby Saturn got bigger and bigger and bigger, as it was growing, it got more and more and more and more massive. Today, Saturn is the second most massive planet in the solar system. So eventually, the gravity of this growing gas giant put the brakes on Jupiter's inward movement. So we think if this hypothesis is correct, the reason that we have a Mercury, a Venus, an Earth, and a Mars is because we have a Saturn. Without Saturn, we would not have an inner solar system. So it actually not only put the brakes on Jupiter's movement inward, it started to pull, both planets started to migrate back outward because Saturn got so massive. So Jupiter first pushed inward and then pulled back out, pulled by the influence of the young Saturn. So this is, I guess, why it's called the grand tack. Apparently in sailing, a tack is where you switch directions, like going around a buoy. So Jupiter, started inward, moved back outward. And when it moved out, it left the remaining asteroid belt all scrambled up. And because it had pushed so much material into the sun or just flung it right out of the solar system, there wasn't much left to make Mars. So that's the reason we think uh, Mars is so small. That is one of the reasons we think our asteroid is all mixed up our asteroid belt's all mixed up. And we think this may be why there are no, in our solar system, no planets inside of Mercury's orbit. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. But when we look at other solar systems, we see planets very close to our sun, much closer than Mercury is. So it's possible we did have things that, or would have had things closer to our star than Mercury if Jupiter hadn't plowed the, much of the inner solar system into the sun and would have continued to plow all of us into the sun uh, if it weren't for the young Saturn. So that's how uh, gas giants can play a role in the formation of rocky worlds. Uh, and before I move on to another fun planetary migration theory, Emily, have any questions popped up? Any clarifying questions? We'll, I'll also leave time for at the end for questions. So if you do have a question, you can always ask it at the end as well. Yeah, I haven't seen any questions come in yet, um, but maybe by the time you take another question break, then we'll have a few. Oops. All right, so that's the grand tack and how the inner solar system almost got pushed into the sun. Now, I've mentioned how Jupiter wasn't just 
pushing things into the sun. It was also flinging things out because gravity can have that effect as well. And that's going to have an important effect on our next theory, which is called, it's still centered around Jupiter. It's called the jumping Jupiter theory, which is a fun name. So the grand tack when Saturn pulls Jupiter back out into the outer solar system, this does not, this model does not end with Jupiter and Saturn in their current positions. So how did they get there? Well, of course they must have kept moving, but if they moved apart, at this point they were pretty close together. If they moved apart gradually, that actually would have caused the inner solar system to get screwed up again. And that did not happen. So they must have moved apart pretty quickly. And one way for that to happen is to take into account those other gas giants that are out in the outer solar system. So here are the planets of the outer solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And one way to get Jupiter to and Saturn to move apart quickly, in fact, to make Jupiter jump to where it is now, is that they both interact with a third planet. Something about the mass of Uranus or Neptune. Well, that makes sense, right? Because we have two planets that have that mass. We have Uranus and Neptune. So it must've been one of them, but here's the problem. Every model that shows this interaction happening shows that, that smaller gas giant getting along out of the solar system. Clearly Uranus and Neptune are still there. So they did not do this because they didn't get flung out of the solar system. We think that in fact, our solar system very well may once have had five gas giants instead of four. That there was a, a third, what we call now the ice giants, those smaller gas giants, Uranus and Neptune with lots of ices in their atmosphere. <clears throat> so we think that there used to be another one that it was located between Saturn and Uranus and that it was about the same mass as Uranus and Neptune. Those two planets are very, very close to each other in mass. They're very similar to each other in many ways. So we think there was in fact at one point a fifth gas giant and that this interaction with this fifth gas giant actually pulled Saturn out even farther to where it is today and that same interaction caused this fifth giant to sort of get flung inward where it then interacted with Jupiter. And Jupiter's interaction with it caused Jupiter to move very quickly to its current day location. And that same interaction flung this gas giant out of the solar system completely. Now, this is not the only evidence that we have that there was once a fifth gas giant uh, in the solar system. We actually also, it's not just the fact that Jupiter had to get to its current position pretty quickly. We also see patterns in things like the Kuiper belt, the region out past Neptune, that suggest that uh, there was once a fifth gas giant affecting the way things uh, evolved out there. And because remember, we have to look at where things are now and figure out how they got that way. And a couple of the patterns of things that we see moving around in the Kuiper belt, which is out, you know, past Neptune, out where Pluto is, uh, can be explained much better if there used to be a fifth gas giant. So that means Jupiter flung a planet out of the solar system. It wasn't just flinging, flinging little bits of rock or even little planetesimals, it flung a whole gas giant out of the solar system, according to this theory. So then the uh, question is, does that happen? Do we actually see planets out there? Can that, are there just planets wandering out in space? And the answer is yes. We call them rogue planets. And here is an artist's rendition of one. Uh, and these are in fact planets that have been flung out of their solar system. We're not actually sure how many there are, but we think there could be a ridiculous number of them in the solar system. 
thousands, many thousands. For each star you can see, there may be thousands of rogue planets out there drifting in between the stars. Now, these are very, very difficult to find because they're uh, not reflecting light from a star because they're not orbiting a star. So they're very difficult to find, but they do give off uh, a certain amount of heat, which means they can be detected in the infrared. So that is how we have found them up till now. We have found things that we believe to be rogue planets out, out in space uh, by finding infrared detectors. So when you, if you ever see like night vision goggles, those are essentially infrared detectors. Anything that gives off heat becomes visible. And uh, we, that telescope I mentioned before, the Nancy Grace Roman telescope, uh, that is going to be very good at finding things at, like rogue planets. So maybe we can start to get a handle on how many of them there are out there. Cause right now we've only found a few and we're trying to guess how many, but we think it actually may be very common for young planets to get pushed out of their solar systems um, in when the solar systems are still forming. And that this did in fact happen to at least one planet in our solar system. There are theories that maybe at one point there were actually six gas giants. Maybe two of them got flung out. There is even a theory uh, that that might be, you know, we're sort of trying to see if there's a planet out past Neptune, something that we sometimes call planet nine, for which we have a little bit of evidence, but we've never actually found. And if it was out there, maybe, just maybe, that's what this would be, is a planet that was half flung out of our early solar system. Um, but this thing, the fifth gas giant, we think was flung out completely and is drifting out there somewhere. So all of our planets in our solar system have this sort of lost brother or sister out there somewhere drifting through the stars. <coughs> and that can happen because of planetary migration. Now this is not, I should emphasize, uh, as much as science fiction likes to play with themes like that, that is not something we have to worry about happening today. If we go back to our current day view of our solar system, our solar system is still a very busy place and there's still a lot moving around out there, but planets settle into stable orbits over time. And our solar system is billions of years old. That is time enough that all of our planets have settled into very stable orbits. So we don't have to worry be anymore about Jupiter migrating. We don't have to worry about planets getting flung out of the solar system anymore. Uh, this is a, an older, more mature, much more stable solar system that we live in today. Uh, so I don't want anybody getting nervous that they have to worry about Earth getting flung out of the solar system or getting pushed into the sun because Jupiter decides to go for a walk again. This is an early solar system problem. Okay, I talked a whole lot and I talked about some very weird things and I would love to know if anybody has any questions about them or anything I can clarify or Emily, have any questions come in? They have. We have quite a few questions. Okay, um, go for it. A couple, a couple specifically about rogue planets. Uh, first, do they tend to be bigger than our planet? And also, how long does it actually take for a rogue planet to be flung out of the solar system? Uh, so we not we're not sure how big rogue planets tend to be bigger ones are a little bit easier for us to find right now so we the ones we have found we think are mostly small gas giant stage which would be bigger than the earth but again they give off they're bigger they give off more heat they're easier to find it's just like when we first started to find exoplanets we were first finding all the really big ones because it's easier for us to find those as our detection methods get better, we're likely to start finding smaller ones as well. And things like the, the Roman Space Telescope are going to be better at finding smaller ones as well. And in terms of how long this takes, um, the actual migration process for planets, we're talking short time frames for a solar system, uh, long time frames in terms of how humans think of things. We're talking a couple of million years. like. It, this probably started happening about 500 million years after the solar system formed and happened over the course of like uh, 10 to 20 million years. So that sounds like a lot from a human's perspective, but in terms of a solar system's history, that's very quick. 
Cool, thank you. Um, <laughs> how do gas giants start to form in the first place? That is an excellent question. So all planets start to form when things start to clump together in an early, in the, basically a solar system forms out of a cloud, a cloud of gas and dust around a young star. We call those protoplanetary disks. And in that disk, there's a lot of dust and that dust starts to stick together and become clumps of rock. And those clumps of rock start to stick together and become planetesimals. And those planetesimals start to stick together and become the cores of planets. If this happens in closer to the star, most of the gas has been blown outward by the activity of that young star. So these are going to form uh -huh, Katie's got a planetary formation video for us. So this is the kind of place where stars and planets start in solar systems form. This is a nebula. And it, in the inner part of these protoplanetary disks, there's not a lot of gas. So these planet cores don't, they basically just stay rocky balls. And that's how you get rocky planets with very thin atmospheres like Earth. So here in this video, we see a star starting to form out of the nebula where it comes together and then it ignites and it becomes the baby star. And then in the outer part of the disk, farther from the star, there's not as much, the, the star does not push the gas out as much. So there's a lot of gas in the outer part of the disk. So these planet cores that form out there can start building up huge atmospheres. And these atmospheres just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger until the planet's basically all atmosphere. And that's how a gas giant forms. They have to form farther out away from the young star. Awesome. Uh, I think we have time for maybe just one more question. And I have a couple people asking about Pluto in particular. They noticed how funky its orbit is around the sun. And someone was wondering if Pluto is considered a rogue planet. No, because we know Pluto formed there. Pluto formed as part of a Kuiper, uh, the Kuiper belt. So Pluto's orbit is very, very normal for a Kuiper belt object. Kuiper belt objects have tilted oval orbits. They orbit out past Neptune. They're mostly made out of ice. And that all describes Pluto. When we first found Pluto in 1930, we didn't know that much about it. And we sort of at the time assumed that everything that orbited the sun was probably a planet. And we now know that's not true. And so Pluto's orbit looks weird for a planet. It looks very normal for a Kuiper belt object. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Talia. Um, let's see, I'm going to remove Katie's spotlight. I'll come on screen. Um, Talia and Katie, do you guys wanna say goodbye to everyone before we wrap up the show? Bye everybody, thanks for coming. Bye. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. And folks, thank you so much for uh, joining us today for your participation in the chat box, the Q&A box. Um, your questions were wonderful, and I'm just so sorry that we didn't have time to get to all of them. Uh, keep in mind that we do these programs once a week, so maybe you could get a question answered for the next one. Uh, but until then, let me show you all our farewell screen. We always like to say that if you enjoyed today's um, virtual program, you can definitely check out more of them at mos.org slash mos at home. And again, if you enjoyed this particular program, we would just love it if you supported the museum by visiting engage.mos.org slash welcome. So with that, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next time. <laughs>